Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp, joined here by my co-host, Blake Alderman. Blake, it's been quite a while for a variety of reasons. I know uh, we've had some health issues in there and whatnot, but we haven't shot an episode in a while. Definitely planning to get back to a much more regular schedule. I guess first off, Blake, uh, I want to outline for our fans kind of what we're hoping to do during football season, since we're now in season again. Uh, Blake, uh, I think what we'd like to do is shoot a, a very quick podcast on Sunday, uh, probably be out Sunday afternoons just with our initial reactions from games uh, that previous Saturday. And then we'll come back on Monday morning with a more full in-depth podcast breaking down the game after we've had a chance to rewatch it. Thursdays, we'll be putting out a preview episode. So that's kind of going to be the flow for the season, hopefully two to three episodes per week. If we have to sacrifice one, it'll be that Sunday one because of travel. Uh, but Blake, that's how we want to do it. Uh, first off, I guess, how are you doing, man? It's been a while. Man, I'm hanging in there. It's been a funky uh, couple weeks for us. Um, you know, between my house, the entire house having COVID, and I was staying at my in-laws, and I was at my parents, just trying to quarantine and, and keep our three-year-old daughter safe. So it's uh, it's 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 nice that things are going back to normal. I'm definitely glad that the season started, but I'm I'm definitely glad that those those couple weeks are out of the way now. Absolutely, man. Glad to hear that you're uh, you're on the mend and. You know, we're only a week away from football season. I think, uh, I don't know, I can't tell whether this offseason went quick for me or, or, you know, didn't. It was like last year was that weird in-between where it was like, you know, every day was something new in terms of a new protocol they were putting out or are we going to play or are we not going to play. This fall, uh, knock on wood so far, has been pretty smooth, even with the concerns about Delta. I mean, Florida got through fall camp really without issue. Obviously, you know, a couple injuries that we'll talk about when we kind of go through the roster and, and the depth chart, but... uh I mean, Blake. For the most part, we're we're where we expected to be a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I don't know about the off season being really like I I think August for me, just because from the recruiting standpoint of it being a dead period, August has felt like it's drug on forever. But yeah, June felt like enough. a whirlwind. Um, July was kind of slow, but then he had some camps. You know the you know the the opening, the Elite Eleven, things like that. And then that last week of July where they had Friday Night Lights was things picked up. So I'm definitely glad that from a recruiting standpoint. Um, you know, prospects can come visit games, come check things out because it was pretty hard to cover recruiting last year with just no recruits going into games and yeah, no, no coaches doubt. on the road, no in-home visits. So I'm hoping that that schedule goes back to normal in 2021. No doubt, Blake. I am as well. Uh, let's get into fall camp because we really haven't, I don't even think, done an episode really uh, since camp really began. I think we previewed one of the first scrimmages and that was about it. Um Blake, is there, is there a big storyline for you coming out of fall camp? Is there anything that surprised you from camp that caught your eye, things that we probably need to mention for the fans? Uh, you know, I think one of the more interesting things was probably DeMarcus Bowman um, running with the third, fourth team. Um, I, I don't know if it's shocking because you've seen how seniority and, and guys that have been in the program has been something that Florida has really put a lot of a lot of weight into. Um but you see the video clips of this guy just like busting off these long runs against the third and fourth team. So, you know, in your back of your head, you're thinking like, man, this guy has got to mm-hmm. get some meaningful carries. And I'm not so sure that's going to be the case this season, just because Florida has Naquan Wright, Damian Pierce, um, uh, Malik Davis, you know, they've got some guys that have been in the program for a while that you would think just how the coaching staff is gone, that those are going to be the guys that are going to get the bulk of the carries. But, you know, it's, it's definitely weird to see a guy that's so talented. That's, you know, third or fourth on the depth chart at best. Yeah, I know we talked about a lot going into the spring. Obviously, he had the minor knee injury that kind of kept him out of the second half of the spring. We talked about him being a guy that, you know, a potential difference maker given his speed at running back. I think the three guys that are coming back, you know, being Damian Pierce, Malik Davis, and Naquan Wright, all those guys have their strengths individually. You know, Malik Davis can be a pass catcher out of the backfield, can really offer you some some good hands for a running back. Naquan Wright, I thought, showed pretty good vision, good patience as a runner. Damian Pierce, you know, if, if, if you need to run into a pile and drive it a couple yards, he's probably the guy from that standpoint. But, you know, DeMarcus Bowman has that extra gear. And I think, uh, you know, the difference between him and Lorenzo Lingard was he wasn't coming off as serious an injury. You know, obviously Lingard had with the knee at Miami. You thought maybe he'd get into things a little bit quicker at Florida. But I would say based on fall camp, it's really like, to your point, not really what happened. And uh, I, I think, like you said, Florida staff does have a tendency to play veterans. I think they, they really tend to focus on, can you do all the little things that go into playing running back? We've seen the same thing at receiver. You know, it's, it's the reason that Kadarius Tony was mostly a gadget guy until really 2020 when he started to put it all together and they started to trust him more. Um, Blake, to me, I, I, I 
coming out of fall camp, I look at the makeup of Florida's team overall, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here in our conversation, um, but I look at Florida as a team that is going to need some things to happen in an explosive manner on offense to be able to feel good in games about their ability not only to keep up with opponents, but to, to really be competitive against top-notch teams. I'm just not, I, I guess... I guess really where I'm going with this, Blake, is, is we need to talk about quarterbacks. Because for me, when you come off a guy like Kyle Trask, who you could pretty much count on 9 out of 10 series to go out there and get you some kind of points. You know, even if the drive stalls, you're going to get a field goal. And you're coming into a, a situation now where you have a new starting quarterback in Emory Jones. The reports out of fall camp, and granted, they are secondhand reports. You know, we weren't out there ourselves to see it in person for the second year. A little bit frustrating from our end having to rely on sources, but we do trust our sources and the sources that we've talked to have indicated Emory Jones is not going to be the kind of passer that Kyle Trask was, right? And so I think for Florida's offense, you even heard it a little bit from Dan Mullen throughout the course of fall camp. They're not probably going to execute as consistently as they did last year. The difference is going to be they may be a little bit more explosive. To me, when you talk about wanting to be more explosive, Demarcus Bowman's absolutely a guy that you got to get involved. Blake, I guess uh, let me let me flip this back around to you. How concerned are you about the offense as a whole, and is that the main reason you want Bowman on the field, or you just think he's he's just that good, and uh, maybe you don't have these same concerns about the offense that I do? I think more so for me, it's just that I think he's that good. You know, I've seen him play in high school. I just think that if you know you talk about explosive players, that's definitely you know the bill that he fits. I do think there are some concerns with the quarterback, and I think that it depends on how you're going to look at it. If you're expecting Emory Jones to come out and be Kyle Trask, you're setting yourself up for some disappointment just because that's just not going to happen. That mm-hmm. that's that is really hard box to fit to fit Emory Jones in. I think that I think he can make a lot of the throws. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be able to open things up with his legs. Um, he's just not going to be as consistent and have the touch on his throws that Kyle Trask had, and and, and that's not really trying to like dump on Emory Jones. I, I mean, just think that it's really hard per like, I mean, Kyle Trask was really great. That was, he was a lead doing records, those kind of Heisman things. Finalist. And I mean, he, he, the touch he had on throws that that's just really hard to match. But I think whenever you see the reports from fall camp to where he's been kind of inconsistent, been up and down. And it seemed like, you know, Anthony Richardson has been a guy that's kind of been on his heels, you know, really had a good camp, really throwing things around. Good. Seems more comfortable as a thrower, making those throws to the next level and the short passes and all those kind of things. I'm wondering if we have a little bit of a, a quarterback battle on our hands, even though I don't think, I mean, don't get me wrong. I truly think that that Emory Jones is going to be the guy that takes the starting snaps. That's been said over and over again, but it has seen that. I mean, Emory Jones is, is going to be the guy, but Anthony Richardson seems like he's going to get some playing time for sure. Yeah. I think that's unquestionably the case, you know, and I it, you use the term quarterback battle. And, and I think, you know, I think that's essentially what it is without really being that. You know, I, and there's no chance that uh, Anthony Richardson is the starter on Saturday against Florida Atlantic. Sure. I, don't, I don't think anybody's saying that. Um, I would be floored if anybody other than Emory Jones is not the starter against Alabama. Now, having heard what we have throughout fall camp and, and some of the opinions that we've gotten on Anthony Richardson, not just from our own sources, but from guys like Steve Spurrier, who's been out at practices, has been pretty impressed with him. If you remember back... Steve Spurrier has always been very impressed with Kyle Trask, even when Felipe Franks was starting. He's, he guy's got an eye for quarterbacks. So I, I think, to me, you're at the point where, okay, you got three games. It's almost like too many seasons to me is, is kind of how I view it. You've got the first three games where everything in those first three games is building into that Alabama game. You know, whatever you're going to do against Florida Atlantic, whatever you're going to do against USF, that's about, you know, building into that Alabama game plan. So, you know, whether that's, you know, ironing out things that you really want to be able to do within the playbook with Emory Jones to, to really iron those out before Alabama, get those settled, um, kind of figure out what you have, figure out, you know, are the weaknesses really weaknesses? Do we want to steer away from those? I think everything in those first two games builds into that Alabama game. And then I think based on how that Alabama game goes, based on how Emory Jones handles everything about playing a, a truly marquee opponent, a big, big time outfit in the swamp. You know, if that goes poorly, maybe you start to consider in that second half of the season, those those second nine games where, you know, at that point, win or lose against Alabama, that's the rest of your, you know, the meat of your schedule. Can you get to Atlanta? Can you give yourself maybe a second shot against Alabama? That all becomes a second half of the year where you figure things out after you get by Alabama. 
And if Emory Jones is pretty definitively not the guy against Alabama, then maybe you start transitioning. I, I don't expect that that's going to happen that quickly. Like, you know, they, they go through the Alabama game, all of a sudden Anthony Richards starting in game four. I don't see that. But I think to your point, what we learned from fall camp is that this is not a closed, open and shut situation. Emory Jones is the starter. That's it. I think that's where we were with Kyle Trask last year, where the only way you're going to see someone else is if he gets hurt. I don't know that 2021 Florida is in the same boat. And I think that's where we're coming out of fall camp. I wouldn't say, Blake, that we have any more questions about Emory Jones now than we did going into camp. I think the question marks, and I guess I should be specific, what we've heard from Emory is basically that the accuracy is not consistently there. And what's happening is a lot of times on the intermediate throws, especially throws over the middle, we're having balls hit the ground, uh, throws sailing, just just generally throws that you would think should not be super hard throws for a high-level SEC quarterback are not being completed. Now, Emory Jones is also throwing some terrific passes. Let's let's not downplay what Emory's doing in terms of his arm talent. He's got the arm talent to really, really connect with some deep balls downfield. We've seen it a couple times in, in you know scrimmage clips and things. I know he threw one beautiful corner route to Jacob Copeland for a touchdown in one of the scrimmages. So, you know, the ability is there. The question mark, like you said, is the consistency. You know, is Florida able to string together drives like they did last year? Probably not. But are they able to hit explosives very quickly? Maybe. And if so, then maybe you can make up enough differences in other places like the O-line, like the defense, where you can still be competitive, where you can still potentially push for a playoff spot. Blake, if there's one spot coming out of fall camp that you're extremely concerned about, thing, you know, a unit or a position group or whatever that could hold back the team, what is it? I think for me, it's cornerback. And I'd say that I know Kyrie Elam is very good. I don't have my mm-hmm. concerns there. My concern is who's on the opposite side of him. You have Jaden Hill, who's torn his ACL. He's going to be out for the season. He's probably the guy on Florida's roster that has the bulk of you know, most of the actual game experience. So don't get me wrong. Elijah Blades comes in as a graduate transfer, has played in some SEC games at Texas A&M. You've got some guys that have, have – Avery Helm played in some games for Florida last year. I believe the, the Cotton Bowl last year was yep. really the game where he got a lot of his snaps. My concern is you just don't have a lot of guys who have a lot of big-time snaps, a lot of experience on the opposite side of Kyer Elam. So my concern isn't really the position as a whole because, again, I think that Kyer Elam is going to do his thing on one side of the field. My concern is the other side of the field. No, and I agree with you, and I think the the injury to Jaden Hill, again, uh, really you knew coming into this year that you weren't going to have a lot of experience depth, and so you hate to lose a guy like that that's a veteran who, you know, even if he doesn't have the top-end talent, I think it was way early to know whether or not Jaden Hill was going to be a quality starter. Even if he didn't, you know, wasn't a surefire guy like Kair, you're losing a guy that had a lot of experience, and you don't have guys with experience to replace him. Now, credit to Dan Mullen and his staff, in hindsight, them going out and adding two guys this offseason in Jadarius Perkins from Missouri and Elijah Blades from Texas A&M. Those look like terrific additions now because you may very well need them. Uh, But to your point, depth in the secondary is a little bit shaky, and that's on top of not knowing what we're going to get already with these new guys. For me, Blake, I I think the most disappointing thing for me from fall camp, and then on the second half of the show, we'll probably talk more about the positives. I was a little bummed about the O-line, man. We've been talking about this group for, it seems like, years now. You know, you thought this is probably year three, you know, for, for a lot of John Hevesy's guys. You know, you're talking about the Kingsley Aguacoons, um, you know, Ethan White, uh, Michael Tarquin, a lot of these third-year guys. I guess the good news is Kingsley is now stepping up at center. We would expect him to start on Saturday. And I do think that gives you a lot of position flexibility in terms of where Ethan White goes, where Josh Braun goes. Uh, but I'm a little little disappointed to see that Josh Braun right now is the sixth man. I thought he was a guy that you probably need to get in your best five. You still have Jean Delant starting over at right tackle. Um, you know, how Florida adjusts there, it, it seems like if there's issues that Stuart Reese will probably kick out the right tackle and then you'll put Braun in at right guard. Uh, but Blake, to me, I just I didn't hear enough progress from that O-line to really feel comfortable. Again, you go back to the consistency thing. Um, you know, I, I think this offense is going to be more boom or bust than last year, you know? It's really important for the O-line to hit all those assignments. It's really important that you have veteran running backs that know how to pick up their cues and pass protection when you have a guy like Kyle Trask who's going to be sitting in the pocket and operating from the pocket. And so from that standpoint, I totally understood, you know, Florida's leaning on a lot of veterans last year. Now when you have a dual threat guy who can make things happen, can extend plays in the pocket with Emory Jones, 
going back to you know the Demarcus Bowman point, I think you can get away with a little bit more favoring guys that are explosive over guys that necessarily know all the you know how to cross the T's and dots the I's on offense. So that'll be interesting to me. I, I wish the O line had made a little bit more progress, but there were a lot of positives from fall camp too, and I want to talk about those. So Blake, let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back on the other side, wrapping up fall camp and starting to preview Florida as it gets into the season. Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman. Blake, uh, I want to talk about some of the positives from fall camp because I do think there were several. Uh, you know, I'll maybe cheat a little bit here and mention a few. I thought Jacob Copeland had a really, really good camp from everything I heard. Um, Nick Elksness, a guy that we've talked about a couple times more on Swamp 24-7 than the podcast lately. Uh, but he's a freshman tight end who I thought had a really, really good camp, fought through an injury even. And so that's when you start to know the coaches can count on you. Like for you, what's the what's the position group you come out most excited at a fall camp? For me, it's linebacker. I think when you look at a lot of the guys there, um, you know, you have Ventrell Miller returning. Um, you have a guy like Dewan Black who's played a little bit of nickel, has played some safety, could play some linebacker. I think you've got a lot of guys that, whereas last year, you know, James Houston, you kind of knew what he was getting yourself into. I think there's a lot more excitement in a group that really got bottled up by the defensive line the last year, just getting caught in the blocks and all the wash. So I think this year, I, I I really like what they're putting together as far as a roster from the guys. I think Christian Robinson's done a really good job recruiting a lot of these guys. And I think that's a position group that you're going to see be a lot more athletic, a lot more physical, and not get caught up so much in the wash. Because you look at the guys that Florida's added through the transfer portal and defensive line, I think that that's going to take care of itself from guys getting blown back. When you look at just the sheer size they've added there. So I think that I'm going to, I'm excited about seeing this linebacker group with a little bit more athleticism um, and, and getting some, some time for some of these guys like Tyron Hopper, you know, some of the other guys, uh, Derek Wingo, some of those guys that are young that are now getting some, their first real true test of fall camp, spring ball, all those kind of things. And I think that's a group that I think is, is going to take a next step for the, for the coaching staff after not really having a good, you know, last season and, and maybe even the season before. Yeah, I think that's a group, like you said, that can benefit more from a normal offseason than maybe anybody else. You talk about, you know, Diabate last year really coming from a guy that had primarily only been an edge rusher. All of a sudden you're learning to play in between the tackles. That's a tough adjustment. And I, I think, you know, what you kind of hit on, I think that D-line can really make life easier on the linebackers. That's the group that I kind of look at as, you know, if Florida's going to take the next step, if they're going to break through and be a playoff contender, if they're going to potentially beat Alabama, beat Georgia, that's the group that really has to come along and kind of be the difference maker for Florida this season. You mentioned it. They brought in two graduate transfer defensive tackles, a lot of positive reviews about those guys. You got Brenton Cox back, although he's still trying to get healthy a little bit. You got Zach Carter back, Jeremiah Moon, Chris Bogle, Andrew Chatfield. I mean, the number of guys that you have, Javon Dexter, the number of guys that you have that are potential big time impact players on the D line is substantial. And I think it's been a while since we've seen that kind of depth at Florida. I guess the question mark for me, Blake, about that group, knowing how excited I, I am about them, who's the real difference maker? You know, Brenton Cox, I think, was from a pass rushing standpoint, pretty close to that last year. The problem was that he was a little bit one dimensional, wasn't necessarily as good against the run, and I thought that took a toll on the defensive front as a whole. I think, you know, having Zach Carter back now with some extra interior guys, you know, you got Jervon Dexter's a year older, you've got those two graduate t transfers. I think that allows Carter to play outside more, and now I think you've got a more stout front four. And I think, to your point, if those guys can really be aggressive, you know, occupy some double teams in the middle, allow those edge rushers free, and then, you know, allow the linebackers free behind them to go make plays unimpeded, I think you have the potential to be really good in the front seven. And like, if Florida is a lot more aggressive getting after the quarterback, that lessens a lot of the pressure on that secondary. Gives you the chance maybe to be a little bit more opportunistic. I, again, look back to last year. I thought one of the big problems with Florida's defense wasn't necessarily that they weren't disruptive. It was the fact that they weren't disruptive against the elite teams and then the fact that they didn't generate enough turnovers. When you look at Todd Grantham's defense, the entire idea is to disrupt the quarterback, get him off his spot, and then force turnovers. You know, whether it's takeaways or turnovers, uh, via you know stopping them on downs, you want the ball back in the offense's hands. That's that's primarily Todd Grantham's goal. They'll gamble a little bit to get there more so than most defenses, but you're trying to put the ball back in the offense's hands, and we just didn't see that happen enough times last year. I think the defensive line has the potential to really make or break Florida season this year. I agree with that, and I think that that was 
really that was the trickle down effect for last year. I think the secondary struggled on its own, but I think whenever you look at just the sheer fact that those guys were getting pushed around, you were getting to the next level. I think that that was kind of something that that just continued to, it was a compounding effect. It just continued, you know, the defensive line was pushed back in the linebackers, then the, the defensive backs, you have this quarterback who has all the time in the world to throw and, and coverages were busted. So I think that that's really the next step. And I really like a lot of the pieces that Ford has put on there. There's no doubt. I mean, you know, this this defense has recruited well. It's something that we've talked about really for the last year or two, you know, that the on paper, the defensive recruiting has been very good. And I think this is the year, like you said, guys like Tyron Hopper, like Derek Wingo, uh, Chris Bogle, those are the guys that really need to take a step forward for Florida to take that next step. Blake, I think for a lot of fans, year three last year with Kyle Trask, Knowing the number of weapons you had on offense, you had a generational talent in Kyle Pitts, you had a first-round receiver in Kadarius Toney, Kyle Trask gets drafted in the second round. Last year, in a lot of ways, to me, and I think for a lot of fans, felt like a missed opportunity for Florida. Where does that leave the Gators going into 2021 as far as the program's outlook under Dan Mullen? What, what needs to happen this year? Is there any danger that if Florida does have a down year, that Dan Mullen starts to feel some pressure? What does a down year such that that might happen even look like? What's your what's your general outlook on where Florida's at going into year four under Dan Mullen? You know, I think there's some fans that are a little, a little chippy with this recruiting, not landing enough of those high four-star, five-star type of guys. But when you look at Florida's team recruiting talent on 24-7 sports, they're, they're ranked seven, I believe, was the, was the recent update mm-hmm. there. The transfer portal has really helped Florida a lot there. You know, you've added some guys – former five-star type of guy, some guys that have had some big-time snaps. So for me, I think that – I mean, I don't think there's any hot seat type of talk. I don't think that we're there yet because you look at just the offensive production, and Dan Mullen is one of the best coaches, offensive minds in in the entire college football. So I think that when you look at there – but now you're seeing – His guys, his guys, he's recruited. You're seeing a lot of these guys that he didn't inherit. You know, the guys that he went out and picked and and said, these are the guys that I want to to really represent the team. And this is what we're going to do with them. So I don't know that there's any hot seat talk there, um, but I think that this is the year where a lot of fans, this could silence some of those recruiting, you know, quirks that they have. If some of these guys that Mullen went out and, and recruited that, you know, maybe were a lower three star guy or maybe a sleeper guy or a gym or however you want to cl- classify those types of guys, if they can go out and get some production from some of those guys, I think you're going to see a lot more. Uh, I think you're going to see some of those talks of recruiting. They're still going to be there because fans want the four stars and the five star types of guys. But I think you're going to see a little bit more of, you know, kind of trusting the process, trusting the coach's eyes, if they can get some production from some of those guys. Is it that simple? I mean, is it is it as simple as they get? production and it kind of proves the staff is good at evaluating or is there is there also a danger of Florida got to the SEC title game last year anything short of getting there this year in year four now that Mullen does have a lot of his guys is viewed as a failure I don't know that it's a failure I think when you look at the guys that Florida lost from last year's season I think that that could be the silver lining for maybe some of those talks but I think that I think there's a timer on how quick they get back to Atlanta. Maybe not this year because you're breaking in a new quarterback who's never really been the guy. You know, you're breaking in an offensive line that has some new pieces, but a lot of them are really the same guys. You just know what you're getting out of them. You had a defense last year that really struggled. If you can get some uptick from those guys, I think that will help the offense, obviously, because if you have a good defense, you don't have to go out and score every single time because last year, let's face it, we knew that that was what was going to happen. You know, Florida was going to have to score every single time they had the ball if they were playing a good team. So I think that... I'm trying to think here how I really want to say it. I think there is a timer on getting back to Atlanta. I don't know that it's maybe this year if they don't make it. I think that it's time to call for Mullen's head or you know anything such as that. But I think that eventually you're going to want to see this team start to get back to Atlanta. Maybe not this year, but next year or the year after that. I think probably not the 2021 season. Sure, they're going to want to. And, and I think that's obviously the coach's plans. But I think 2022 is a year where fans are really going to say, you know, here's here's what we've got. We know what we're going to do. If Emory does come back, if, if he doesn't have this miraculous season in 2021, I think he'll be back in 2022. So you're going to see some of those guys that, you know, maybe are a little bit more of a question mark guy that we don't really know what the production is going to be out of them. You know, Florida is going to continue to hit the transfer portal like they have. So there's going to be some shoes, some holes where they're going to be able to fill some guys in there at. So I think that this year, I'm not so sure that 
it's time to hit the panic button if they don't make it to Atlanta. I think you're going to want to obviously see a team come out and be competitive and win games and, you know, get back to those, you know, nine win, 10 win type of seasons that you used to under Dan Mullen. But for me, I, I'm just not sure this is an Atlanta team. See, and I agree. And, and I think that's where last year really hurt you because I think, and, and honestly, to me, it's as simple as not blowing opportunities that shouldn't have been blown. And that all boils back down to the LSU game, honestly. I mean, the Texas A&M game, Florida could have won that. But, you know, that's a talented team. Texas A&M did well. You know, you're going to lose a fumble here and there. Like, that's going to happen. What shouldn't happen is an LSU team that is having an atrocious year is down mid-50s on scholarship players, come into Gainesville and win a game like that, given the kind of mistakes that happened, the Marco Wilson shoot toss. The problem was, for me, that took away a lot of the positive momentum that Florida had built. It took away a lot of the, just the, the um, kind of, it felt like you were pro- progressing in the right direction with Dan Mullen. That, for the first time, I thought was kind of like, uh-oh, what's going on here? And now, to your point, I'm not sure that this team has the talent to get to Atlanta. And Blake, realist, like, you know, whether or not fans... Uh, want to pick this as a, a metric to measure the program on Florida's talent is not a whole lot better in recruiting right now in terms of the classes that Florida put together last cycle and this cycle than what Jim McElwain was doing. And everybody pretty much admitted that the talent level was going to be an issue. Dan Mullen can coach well enough to overcome some of that. The question is how much. And so if Florida's talent really isn't there this year, you know, you have that question mark of even if the talent is there, we saw the talent I thought for the most part was there last year and poor coaching defensively, uh, miscommunication and silly mistakes really ruined Florida season. To me, that ups the pressure on this season. Yes. Georgia is going to be the favorite in the East. You're, you're not going to be favored to win the East. You play Alabama. So I don't know that it's a disappointment, disappointment necessarily if they don't get to Atlanta, but now you're stacking multiple years of potential disappointment. I, I think this year is going to be like if Dan Mullen really wants to prove that he's, you know, a great coach can overcome talent deficiencies. This is going to be the year. And that that's where I go back to Florida is going to need some good bounces. They're going to need some big explosive plays that maybe are unexpected in certain games. They're going to need some good breaks. Um, as far as like Blake, whether or not my outlook has changed based on fall camp, I really I, I don't think it has. Um, I'm a little less optimistic about Florida being able to potentially pull an upset against Alabama than I was uh, a month ago. I, I just don't think I heard enough positive news out of fall camp to make me think that's a realistic possibility. And so at that point, it really it comes back to these huge swing games against you know a Georgia. Can you can you pull off something in Jacksonville when you're maybe the less talented team? Like I, I'll be honest with you, my outlook for this year, I'm thinking probably nine and three. I, I honestly. You know, I, I could see 10 and 2. I can't see 11 wins with this team. I, I just think there's too many question marks. Uh, I don't think Florida has the ability to be an 11 win team with this talent on the roster. And for me, I think that's going to leave fans a little bit unsure of where things are headed going forwards. I agree. I think that's how it's going to be as well. All right, Blake. Well, uh, that, that unless you have anything else today, I think that that'll do it for today. We're going to have a big preview episode talking Florida Atlantic. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to Dan Mullen actually in a little bit here on Monday, get his thoughts on the upcoming game week, and we'll be back with our preview episode on Thursday. So thanks for tuning in, guys. We appreciate it.